Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome to Outlaws and Gunslingers Mafia Edition. Once again, back with some Bonanno family shenanigans. Mm. Told you last week on the Shiro episode, we're going to have about four or five guys on this episode, and we got about four guys, because not one of these. I think the only one that has a story more than uh, two paragraphs is uh, Rastelli. Everybody else, nobody knows about their early childhood or nothing. I don't know about these mobster guys. <sighs> and then when you look at the newspaper articles and shit from back in the day, whenever one of them dies, they're all the same story that you hear every other website. Every other website has the same story that Wikipedia has. And mm-hmm. Nobody has nothing, man. But whatever. Today we're going to cover Gaspar D. Gregorio. I've heard his name a lot. Paul Skaka. Natal Evola. And Phil Rastelli. All three of these, or all four of these... <clears throat> <clears throat> were either interim or uh, became poignant bosses at one point or another. So, and obviously, they're all in order. Uh, D. Gregorio and Skaka, you might know uh, during the Banano the Banana War, these two were side by side against the original Bananos before uh, old Joey got forced into retirement in Arizona. So. We'll start with old Gaspar Di Gregorio. He was a key figure in the Banana War, which I just said. He was born in 1905 in Sicily and then came to America in 1921 by the way of Canada and moved to the Williamsburg neighborhood of Brooklyn. It was here that he would get into bootlegging, and through this, he met future Bonanno boss, Joseph Bonanno. Well, that makes sense. Cool. During the Castle Marizzi War, De Gregorio fought on the Maranzano side. Who won the war? It was then that Maranzano declared himself Capo di Tutti Capi. I didn't know that. Interesting. <laughs> uh, of course, the young guys, led by Lucky Luciano, decided that they were tired of the way that the old school gangsters, who they called Mustache Pete's. Never heard that before. Right. Uh, Maranzano was eventually moited, and old Luciano took over, and he founded the commission, which it settled disputes between families. Sure did. All together, they got together and be like, how are we going to do this? Well, you need to make up for this. You need to make up for that. Well, how's how's twenty thousand dollars? And we'll give you part of the garment racket, or right, something, right. for a couple months. Now, after Maranzano was killed, Joe Bonanno became the boss of the family, now known as the Bonanno family. Clearly, D. Gregorio benefited from this as Joe gave him his own crew. Next thirty years is pretty quiet for old D. Gregorio. Uh, yeah, he got married to Buffalo boss Stefano Magadino's sister. He was then the best man at Bonanno's wedding and became godfather to Joe's oldest son, Billy Bonanno. Oh, look at yeah, that look shit. At that. And then they ended up hating each other. Look right. at that. Usually how it happens. That all came to the end, though, October 1964, when Joe Bonanno decided that he was going to take out the other bosses and make himself the head of the commission. Along with Fafese, boss Joseph Magliocco, they hired future boss Joseph Colombo to take out Lucchese and Gambino. Colombo, he knew how stupid this was, so he went to the other bosses and informed them of the plan. He was like, can you believe this stupid plan? You idiot. Lucky's like, man, that is pretty stupid. Well, Lucky's nowhere to be found because right. he's dead. Poor guy. Uh, the boss decided that Magliocco couldn't have planned this alone, and they knew that old Joey Bananas was behind this. Like, Magliocco, he's so stupid. Right. Well, Joey said, you know what? I'm dead. Nope. Nope. Somebody kidnapped me, but they didn't. It's faked. And Magliocco was spared his life. But... His title of boss of the Profezi family was stripped. Magliocco lost the Profezi family, and Bananas lost his whole everything. October 64, during Bonanno's two-year absence, Bonanno soldier D. Gregorio took advantage of family discontent over Joseph's son Bill Bonanno's role to claim family leadership. The commission named D. Gregorio as Bonanno family boss, and the D. Gregorio revolt led to four years of strife in the family, yep. which we call the Banana War. Yep. This led to a divide in the family between old Bill Bonanno and loyalist to D. Gregorio. Yeah, you're going to have that both. Just killing each other. <sighs> Early 1966, D. Gregorio, he allegedly contacted Bill O. Bonanno about having a peace meeting. Bill agreed, suggested his grand uncle's house on uh, Troutman Street in Brooklyn. He's like, let's meet there. They both agreed. 28th uh, January, 1966, Bill and his loyalists approached that very house they were supposed to meet. Well, you know what happened there. Pew, 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 pew. Pew, pew. pew. But no one was wounded during this confrontation. Joe Bonanno then popped back up in May of 1966 in an effort to study. He's like, oh, Napoliatano, whatever his name was. Napolitano. Napolitano. 
What is his name? Nappy Lotano. Nappy Lotano. Nappy Lotano. Right. What did Nappy Lotano do? No, Napoleon. Napoleon. Oh, Napoleon, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> Just pop it up out of nowhere. Right. Where were you? On an island. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he was on the island. Yeah, he was on St. Saint... Right. No, it was St. Helena was the last one. What was the other one? The one in Madagascar or something off Madagascar. No, that was the... Um, here on island fucking oh, one right. we did. <laughs> right. you know, it's all the same. Yeah, man. Joe Bonanno popped back up in May of 1966 in an effort to stop the bloodshed. He's, all right, guys, come on. He demanded again that his old son be put in charge of the Bonanno family, which the other bosses said, no, very fast. He didn't even get his sentence out. He's like, no. He said, you know what I want, but no. No, no, no. War continues. <laughs> War continues. From a New York Times article on June 13th, 1970, it states, the Banana War became murderous in 1967 when the three Skaka adherents were shot dead by machine gun fire in the Sarp- Cypress Gardens restaurant in Ridgewood, Queens. Since then, the casualties on both sides have included at least seven known dead, oh, wow. three missing and presumed murdered, and several injured. Oh, yeah. Mr. D. Gregorio was under subpoena of grand juries in Brooklyn. If anybody related to organized crime is missing, they're dead. Right. <laughs> more, for, more than likely. Except for Joe Bonanno, apparently. <laughs> right. But more than likely. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, D. Gregorio was under subpoena in grand juries in Brooklyn and Nassau County to testify in their investigations of the Banana War. And of loan sharking, gambling, labor extortion, and other rackets and business interests extending across the nation and into Canada. Before each of Mr. DiGregorio's scheduled grand jury appearances in recent years, just pull an old book out of Galante, or, right? The chin, yeah. yeah. Uh, physicians found that his heart ailment made it impossible for him to testify without risking another heart attack. Oh, poor guy. Jeez, 1968, O. De Gregorio was wounded by machine gun fire and later suffered a heart attack. Oh, shit. The commission eventually de- became dissatisfied with De Gregorio's efforts. Like, at- dude, you keep having heart attacks. <laughs> right, and you're not even you're not even uh, stopping this family rebellion right. you got going on here. How can you be boss when you can't even stop this shit? And they eventually dropped him and swung their support to uh, Paul Skaka. 1968, after f- a heart attack, O. Joseph Bonanno ended the family warfare. By agreeing to retire as boss and move to Arizona. Jeez, so he still hadn't... He could have just ended it. Right. Idiot. As part of this peace agreement, Bill also resigned as consigliere, and he moved out to New York. No, he moved out of New York with his father to Arizona. Good for them. June 15, 1970, Gaspar De Gregorio died of lung cancer at St. John's Episcopal Hospital, Smithtown, New York. He's buried in St. Charles Cemetery in Farmingdale, New York, Section 30, Row X, Grave Number 60. Oh, wow. If you ever want to visit, Jesse D. Gregorio Nadler, who was a known family associate, left New York City in the mid-1990s for New Orleans, South Florida, and California. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, cool. Old Gaspar is portrayed by Richard De Alessandro in Season 3 of the TV series Godfather of Harlem. I'm going to have to watch that, damn it. Yeah, well, is that the one with it's Forrest? Forrest. Yes, I am. going to bring us to the next guy up, Paul Skaka. Skaka. New York City mobster who succeeded Bonanno. No, he didn't. He succeeded Di Gregorio, clearly. Well, I guess technically Bonanno. Right. Um, After Bonanno was deposed of by the commission in late 64, Di Gregorio was named boss. He made Petro Skinny Pete Crociata, the new underboss, and Nicolino Nick Alfano, the new concierge. 66, the commission lost faith in him, and uh, Skaka became the acting boss. Yes, yes. The Bananas War raged throughout the second half of the 60s with Skaka and his top lieutenant, Frank Mari, leading the dissident faction of soldiers and shooters against the Banana Loyalists. Oh, jeez. Man, just can't get a hold of these guys. <laughs> Less than a dozen men were moited during the war, but many low-level soldiers <laughs> and men. What is it? Is it 13 or 11? <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, uh, right. But many low-level soldiers and men on both sides were beaten, shot, and injured. Skaka himself the victim of an attempt on his life. Poor guy. The war should have ended when deposed boss Joe Bonanno suffered a heart attack in 1968 and promised to retire to leave to uh, Tucson. <laughs> yeah, the war should have ended right. then, but it didn't. Right. Right. Uh, also, by 1968, O Bonanno, successor to Gregorio, was ill, and he stepped down as boss and retired. He didn't step down. Yeah, died two years later. The commission sanctioned acting boss Skaka as the new boss of Bonanno crime family. Skaka promoted, he thought, to be a loyal underling Frank Mary to his new... Bo- we already said all this shit. Right. Frank Mary's his underboss. Michael Mike Adamo was promoted to concili- conciliar. Unknown to boss Skaka, though, soon after their promotions, Mari and Adamo begin to plot against him. Oh, jeez. And plan to remove him from power and possibly eliminate him altogether. 
but their plans were revealed, and on the night of September 18, 1968, both men disappeared, never to be heard from again. Mm. Banano soldier and former Mari underling Philip Rusty Rastelli, a former Banano loyalist who switched allegiance to the Di Gregorio Skaka side, became a top suspect in the case for New York City police. Oh, about the disappearance, having also been a top suspect in the Troutman Street ambush. Oh, I bet. Rastelli, who was promoted to capo of the old Mari crew, was never charged in connection with either the ambush or the disappearance. Of course not. But he was promoted once again to concierge by Skaka immediately following the disappearance of Adamo. While former Bonanno loyalist Natal Joe Diamonds Evola was promoted to underboss in place of Mari. Cool. Well, good for Evola. All right. Mm. Well, due to the Bananas War in 1968, <laughs> the commission forced the Gregorio to retire. Didn't it just say he stepped down? <laughs> All right. Uh, Skaka became boss of a most weakened crime family as rivalries and inter- internal dissension continued between the former the Gregorio and Skaka faction. Man. And also, you got the Bonanno loyalists. Hostilities continued within the Bonanno crime family until 1962, well into it. The last known Bonanno crime family member to be moited was soldier Thomas Zumo, a former De Gregorio Skaka fa- faction member. He was shot dead 6th of May, 1969. Hmm. With the removal of disloyal underlings Marian Adamo, Bonanno boss Skaka attempted to unite his crime family once again. Got to do it. By promoting the leaders of the two most influential factions outside his own. Longtime family member and former Bonanno loyalist Evola was leader of what remained of the former Bonanno faction, while Phil Rastelli had gained a great deal of influence with the younger up-and-coming members of the family and was now the leader of the Young Turks faction. Right. By promoting Evola to the underboss and Rastelli to concierge, Skaka hoped to align the Bonanno family and bring it back to the level of power and influence within the mafia it once occupied. Can it do it? Can it do it? Um, I don't think so. In terms of numbers, the Bonanno crime family had always been one of the smaller of the five families, but... It was also one of the most cohesive and well-structured crime families because most of its administration was family members, related by blood or marriage. They knew their places, right? Right. Skaka Skaka hoped to at least mend the broken ties among members and realign the three most influential factions, uh, effectively removing the last of the rivalries and hostilities that were still present, creating cohesion and stability once and for all. May 13, 1971, Skaka was indicted in Manola, New York. On charges of selling $100,000 worth of heroin. Damn. The charge was later dismissed, but he died on August 27, 1986, of natural causes at the age of 77. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Hmm. Concierge Evola. He was born in the Bay Ridge section of Brooklyn. The parents, Filippo and Francesca Evola, natives of Castellamare del Golfo, Sicily. Evola had two brothers, Paul and Joseph, and three sisters, Anna, Josephine, and Mamie. Uh, her last name's gone. Oh, they're all married, besides Annie. Uh, Anna. They're like, why don't you ever get married, Anna? Right. Said, don't fucking like, worry about it. I'm good. <laughs> good. <laughs> Natal never married and lived with his mother in Bay Ridge. Oh, he was a mama's boy. He's oh. like, uh, Paulie. Right. Evola's arrest record would eventually include coercion, possession of gun, federal narcotics law violations. Evola was heavily involved in narcotics trafficking and in labor racketeering in the Garment District of Manhattan. He, all, he was a close associate of Joseph Bonanno, the original boss of the Bonanno crime family. <laughs> in 1931, Evola served as an usher at Bonanno's wedding. Oh, oh, I got the nice. usher role. Nice. 1957, he was identified at the infamous Appalachian, Appalachian meeting in Appalachian, New York, and later charged along with 20 other organized figures with conspiracy. Case never uh, later got overturned. It, oh, yeah. <laughs> the case got overturned. Yeah, it got overturned. All right. April 17, 1959, he was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison after being convicted on conspiracy to distribute narcotics. What is up with these guys? These bosses shouldn't be getting caught with shit like that. Right. Idiot. Uh, Evola had helped manage a large organization that imported heroin from Sicily to the United States. Oh, wow. Fallen family boss Joe Banana. Why did they go all the way back to 59? Idiots. Um, Joe Banana retired. He reportedly became boss of the family. No, you idiots. This is after Di Gregorio and Skaka. Who wrote this? Uh, heavily involved in the trucking industry in the garment district, he cooperated with crime family leaders Genovese and Carlo Gambino of the Gambino, Gambino family. Okay, 28th of April or August 1973, Evelyn died of cancer at Columbus Hospital in the Bronx. He's buried at Calvary Cemetery in the Woodside Queens section of New York. Good for this guy. All right. All right. Can we get a story here, guys? Well, Philip Rusty Rustelli, born January 31st, 1918, tragically passed away on 24th of June, 1991. Mm, good for him. He's an American mobster and former boss of the Battle <laughs> Crime family. Spent all three years of his reign in prison. Yeah. 
Rustelli was born and raised in Maspeth, Queens. He had three bros, Carmine, Marinello, and Augustus. <laughs> Augustus. And two sisters, Justina Davida and Antoinette Brigandi. Brigandi. He reportedly first attracted the attention of police at the age of eight years old when he was charged with being a little delin- delinquent. A little delinquent. A little now delinquent. delinquent. His first commission came three years after school stopped. I'm guessing after he graduated or right. whatever, after he killed someone in a car accident. Rustelli okay. had been driving without a license. From there, he graduated to robberies, contempt of court, and disorderly conduct related to dice games. He graduated. <laughs> in 1950, he was arrested for assault and robbery. How you go? How you go? How does murder get graduated to a robbery? So murder's less than robbery. Well, just because he killed someone in a car accident, it's not murder. Still murder. Well, it's killing. Killing. Probably. I don't. Did he even go to jail? Right. Who knows. Uh, 1950, he was arrested for assault and robbery and was sentenced to 5 to 10, though it was unclear that he ever served time for that. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, he was heavily involved in loan sharking, extortion, drug trafficking activities before joining the Bonanno crime family. He also had a lunch wagon business. Oh, oh, look at him. Look at this guy. Look at that. Wow. After moving to Greenpoint, Brooklyn, where he lived until his incarceration, he met and became close friends with Nobinic Sonny Black Napolitano, Carmine Galante, Joseph Bonanno, and Joseph Messino. December 3rd, 1953, Rostelli is an associate... Rustelian and associate allegedly shot Michael Russo in Queens. Oh, jeez. However, Russo survived the shooting, and Rustelli, fearing identification, went into hiding. Over the next year, Rustelli's wife, Connie, repeatedly approached Russo's wife, Rose, with an offer of $5,000 for her husband if he did not identify Rustelli to the Popos. Rose refused to bribe each time. you got to go back with a different mount. Right. Well, uh, well, unfortunately for her, she should have just took it. Right. It was in early summer 1954, Russo was shot again and killed in Brooklyn. December 13th, 1954, Connie Rostelli was indicted on charges of attempting to bribe a witness. Oh. No one was ever charged in the Russo murder. Rostelli would describe the marital bond between he and Connie, though, as chaotic. And right. he also complained that his wife was domineering. Huh. She drove Rostelli's getaway car on armed robberies, and she kept her husband's gambling records. She also went on a run to abortion. She also went on to run abortion mills for extra cash. Oh, shit. Jeez. Damn. She also was narrowly acquitted by a hung jury on a murder charge. When Connie discovered that a man she had wedded was fooling around behind her back with a much younger woman up in Canada, she beat her rival unconscious and subsequently shot Rostelli twice. Damn. Nevertheless, loyal to a fault, she did not talk to authorities until Rostelli informed her that the marriage was over. Uh, it's like well, marriage is over now? All right. He shouldn't have done it then. What right. an idiot. Well, she then confessed her own and Rostelli's involvement in the Russo murder and other crimes, oh. including racketeering. Jeez. But March 62, before legal proceedings could begin, Connie was believed to have been killed in 1962 after she became an informant. Her body never found. Oh, dude. You already know that. Well, old Rostelli over. said, fuck it, I'm getting married again. This time to girlfriend Irene McKee in 1964. It was dissolved one year later on incompatibility grounds. Right. She's like, I, I'm, not, I'm not compatible with this mobster stuff. Right. <laughs> She's like, I thought I could do it. I just can't. <laughs> I can't be a mob wife. 1968, during a strike in the city, he approved formation of a flying squad of tough guys who firebombed trucks, slashed tires, and assaulted strike breakers. Jeez. 1969, an attempt to restore order to the Bonanno family. The commission appointed a three-man panel to run the family. This panel included Rostelli, Joseph Filippi. And uh, Natal Joe Diamonds of Ola. That's false. Evola's story didn't say that. July 21st, 1971, Rostelli was indicted in Riverhead, New York on loan shark and charges. The loan shark and ring centered in Babylon, New York, and Islip, New York. And they charged victims from 250 to 300% interest annually and generated over a million dollars per year in revenue for the Bonanno family. December 28, 1972, Rostelli was convicted in state court on seven counts of loan sharking. Idiots. Idiots. August 28, 1973, Bonanno boss Evola died of cancer. 23rd of February, 1974, at a meeting at the American Hotel in Manhattan, the commission named Rostelli as boss. Damn, they went that long without having a boss? He was the first member of the Queen's faction to lead the family. Good the previous him. bosses had all come from the family's birthplace in Brooklyn. Look at this guy. Although, history. Right, although Rostelli was endorsed by the commission, the real power in the family soon migrated to rival Carmine Galante who was released from prison at the same time. Uh-oh. Well, March 675, Rostelli was indicted on racketeering charges involving extortion. 
Nine years earlier, Rostelli had established a trade association of lunch wagon operators and taken control of the industry. Any operator who refused to join the association and pay its still fees or stiff fees faced vandalism and physical assault, clearly. Mm-hmm. April 23, 1976, he was convicted of extortion in United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York. August 27, 1976, sentenced to 10 years, served consecutively for a, to a four-year state sentence for conspiracy, criminal contempt of court, and usury. Jeez, oh, come on. He was in prison in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. Rostelli's main contact to the, to, uh, to the Badano family were mobsters Dominique Sonny Black Napolitano and Joseph Messino. Look at that. In Rostelli's absence, Galante seized control of the Badanos as unofficial acting boss. The New York crime families were alarmed at Galante's brazen attempt at taking over the narcotics market. Genovese crime family boss Frank Thierry, he began contacting Cosa Nostra leaders to build a consensus for Galante's moida. He said, gotta go. Even obtaining approval from the retired boss, Joseph Bonanno, he's like, gotta go. It's like, if you didn't want to be like this, if you would let the, the boy, right. let the boy do it. Well, 1979, they received a boost on that when Rostelli and Joseph Messino themselves sought commission approval to kill Galante. Oh, jeez. Their request, request was approved. Napolitano, Nap, Napolitano was later promoted to capo as well, or capo as well as gunman Anthony Indelicato. Okay. Rostelli was now the undisputed boss, controlling things from behind bars through the use of acting bosses such as longtime banano mobster Salvatore Sally Fruits, <laughs> Ferugia. Sally Fruits, huh? Sally Fruits. While Rostelli was in prison, Jeez. Massino began jockeying for power with Dominique Sonny Black Napolitano. Another uh, Rostelli loyalist capo. Both men were themselves threatened by another faction seeking to dispose of the depose the absentee boss led by Capos Alphonse Sunny Red in Delicato, Dominique Big Trin Trinciera, and Philip Giacone. He don't get a nickname. Why? The commission initially tried to maintain neutrality, but in 1981, Massino got word from his informants that the three Capos were stocking up on automatic weapons and planning to kill the Rostelli loyalists within the Bonanno family to take complete control. What the hell is it with the Bonanos and their uh, infighting and shit, dude? Ridiculous. May 5th, 1981, the three Capos were murdered. Oh, jeez. You <laughs> even knew they were going to do it. All right. Jeez. No. Oh, was... the three Capos yeah. that were stocking up. All right. April 21st, 1983, Rostelli was, re- was released. From prison, and he and Messino ordered the murder of Bonanno Capo Cesar Bonaventre. Oh. Oh. Still a fugitive, Messino summoned Vel- Salvatore Vitel, Louis Adanasio, and James Tartaglione to his hideout and gave them the order. By this time, even though Rostelli was still officially head of the family, Messino was considered by most mobsters to be the family street boss and field commander in all but name, right. as well as Rostelli's heir apparent. Right. Right, so how many people are loyal to Messino? This is how you get the right, fucking d- the the uh, dissension. Yeah, this is bayad. This is real bayad. Rostelli was arrested on on a parole violation, sixteenth of August, nineteen eighty four, due to associating with persons engaged in criminal activity. Can't do that. What are you mobsters? You guys ain't gonna right. learn or what? Nineteen eighty five, he was indicted along with other Cosa Nostra leaders in the <laughs> in the famous Mafia Commission trial. Yeah, he was getting kicked off the Mafia Commission because of the Donnie Brasco infiltration. Uh, actually prevented the Bonanno family from getting caught up in the commission trial. Really? Hey, you don't remember? They oh, right, 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 right. Uh, this sentenced many mafia bosses and members to prison. A uh, hundred years for like every one of them. However, when Rostelli was indicted on separate labor racketeering charges, prosecutors decided to remove him from the commission trial. Having previously lost their seat on the commission, the Bonanno suffered less exposure than the other families in this case. Yes, sir. October 14th, 86, Rostelli was convicted on 24 counts of labor racketeering. January 16th, 1987, he was sentenced to 12 years in federal prison. Dang. But June 4th, 1991, he was given a compassionate release from the Federal Medical Center in Springfield, Missouri. June 24th, just 20 days later, he died at a Booth Mo- Mo- at Booth Memorial Hospital, which is now New York Presbyterian, Queens, from liver cancer at the age of 73. He's buried in St. John's Cemetery in Middle Village, Queens. Messino took over as boss of the family. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. It's decent. Rostelli had a nice little change of pace story. Right. I like it when we hear some new stuff. That'll do it for us. In the meantime, go check out our YouTube channel where you get this show plus our other three podcasts that we put up on there every single week plus clips, shorts, uh, YouTube exclusive Dart League. And you never know, maybe there's a YouTube exclusive Pool League coming as well. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. 
That's at Bang Dang Network. And if you're listening on the podcast, give us a review, comment, and uh, we'll see you next week for some more uh, Bonanno family struggles. Shenanigans. And you'll, you'll probably hear the same story again 27 times, but it's cool. We'll see you then where the mother music is. Bang Dang.